$100 plus mileage, the podcast about those New Hampshire bills that don't necessarily make the news, but still could impact you. Bills about the water we drink, how our schools get funded, what does and doesn't get taxed, and much more. There are close to a thousand bills in the New Hampshire legislature this year, and every one of those bills gets a public hearing. Meanwhile, our legislators are paid just $100 plus mileage, which means they're not full-time political scientists. New Hampshire's government is open for you to participate. On this podcast, we highlight some lesser-known New Hampshire bills, give you the unbiased facts, pros, and cons, and highlight opportunities for you to get involved. I'm Anna Brown, Director of Research and Analysis for Citizens Count. And I'm Mike Dunbar, Content Editor for Citizens Count. There's been a lot of talk about gambling in New Hampshire in recent years. Mm -hmm. We had the sports betting debate. We had the Keno debate. We had... Mm -hmm numerous casino debates, <laughs> and now historic horse racing. The idea has been proposed several times over the past few years, but this year it really seems to have gained traction. So, Mike, what do you know about historic horse racing? Yeah, I'll admit, when I first heard about this, I thought it would be way more fun than it actually is. I, I was kind of picturing, like, Strawberry Bank reenactors somehow recreating old-timey horse races, you know, big derby hats and mint juleps. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't appear to be the case. Hats! Kentucky Derby hats, that would make me happy. See, I was <laughs> right? I was thinking more along the lines of, like, uh, this seems like there must be a catch. Like, if it's a historic race and you know how it happened, That's isn't true. that a surefire way to win? Uh, so that also seemed wrong. So, so what is it actually? Uh, okay, so historic horse racing is a form of gaming done at an electronic terminal, usually... Uh, similar to a slot machine. Uh, not much of a gambler, although I did teach myself solitaire o over quarantine, but that's irrelevant. How, how do I hope you're not losing money on solitaire. <laughs> and, and actually, back up, how do you not know how to play? Did you not grow up with Windows 95? Like, how are you only now learning to play solitaire? I mean, you know, my dad is a free cell champ on Windows, <laughs> so the fact that I haven't uh, picked it up until now is pretty pretty alarming. Okay, all right. So, However, back to horse racing. Uh, so I've never personally played one of these historic horse racing games, but uh, here's how it works from what I've gathered. So first, the gamer deposits his or her wager into the machine. The computer then randomly selects a race from a video library of real historic horse races, uh, but it doesn't tell the user where that race took place or when, so, you know, you can't just go look up how it turned out. Curses. The us I know. <laughs> Foiled again. The user does get to see information, though, about uh, the jockey and the trainer's uh, winning percentages, so you can kind of, like, have some educated guess about how it's going to go. Um, there's also an option for the computer to just automatically make a guess for you, uh, on on the user's behalf based on those handicapping uh, numbers. Um, then a video of the historic race plays out, and the better finds out if their horse won. Uh, there are some benefits, obviously, to doing this this way. For one, you don't have to actually attend a horse race uh, at a track somewhere. You also don't have to wait for a real horse race to begin and end to find out if you won. So it's kind of this... Uh, faster process. Yeah, and I think I think you can even like skip the video if you don't want to. Yeah, watch the if little, you're not actually little... interested in horses, you can <laughs> just not, sort of. You don't actually care, and you don't want the suspense. I can right. see, you know, okay, yeah. It's like with scratch tickets. Do you just like scratch the winning number first, and then do them like one by one, or do <laughs> or do you just like go in a line? I got some scratch tickets from a, a relative recently, and I was debating like, how can I make this? What is the mo the optimal scratch order? But anyway, you can. So yeah, only you, uh, Anna Brown. I I know. Well, you know, there's not a lot of fun during COVID. 19 so i have to That's i have true. to make up my own fun so so do you just win or lose like your horse wins or it doesn't well uh not exactly so winnings are based on a traditional paramutal process and this means that the user's initial wager is divided between several different betting pools so for example there might be a pool of money for users who correctly pick the winner of the race. Uh, but then there's another pool for picking the correct order of the top three finishers and so on. So if the user wins any of these, they get winnings from those pools. If not, the money keeps accumulating in, uh, in those pools until a gamer wins a payout. So that's the gist of how it works. I've heard there's a triplet of bills about this. What have you heard about that, Anna? Yes, triplet, triple, something, something, joke about gambling odds. Uh, the legislature does seem to be hedging their bets. There uh, are three bills 
SB 112, HB 626, and part of HB 2, which is actually part of this year's budget. So all these bills have identical text. They begin by adding historic horse racing to the existing laws and rules on electronic wagers. And then those wishing to, goes into, you know, who, who can operate these, which is basically the current licensed charitable gaming venues in New Hampshire. If you don't know, there's 16 of them that are licensed. You can go play poker, for example. So you have to be one of those. The terminals would feature these parimutuel games, which fun fact, since I, I learned a little bit about, it's like those really complex gambling odds if you're choosing like not just who comes in first, but who comes in second. And it's based on how the pool comes in. So someone invented the machine to calculate those like a hundred years ago or something like that. And the machine is called the totalizator, which I'm sorry, just sounds like a made up name. It's like, huh. someone not was like total- the total, not the totaler, not, total- not the calculator. Totalizator. The, yeah. The totalizator, the totalizator. So, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. So there's anyway, the, it, that's how <laughs> they have to calculate it. Like you were talking about. And uh, so those machines would also need to be tested independently and approved by the Gaming Commission. And then wagers would be limited to $25. Okay, okay. So now what happens to the proceeds from these games? I'm sure there's some kind of uh, charitable tie-in, right? Yes, this is always how New Hampshire has sort of uh, cleaned its conscience when it comes (laughs) to sin taxes and things like that. So uh, like I mentioned, 16 charitable gaming venues in New Hampshire. This is already a system that is in place. So charities get 10 days a year, and during those 10 days, they, they get a cut of what is happening at these charitable gaming venues in terms of revenue. So this would be a same deal. Portion of the revenue would be set aside for charitable organizations with a preference given to local charities. An even larger portion would go to state education funding. And then there's a little bit that goes to services for people who struggle with problem gaming. And so, you know, the idea is basically the state says, well, you can gamble, but it can't just be a crazy private enterprise. We want some to help people, and we want some for ourselves, for our schools. Right, right. And I brought that up sort of flippantly, but actually Citizens Count has benefited from charitable gaming in the past. So uh, the revenue from game days can actually be pretty significant for New Hampshire charities. Obviously, we're not taking a position on these bills, um, but full disclosure, we have benefited from similar gaming in the Greenwich State. Yeah, Yes, we have. We are, and we're among a community of nonprofits uh, that are pretty diverse. And the many nonprofits showed up at the bill hearing, for example, SB 112, and said, We love this because if people spend more money at charitable gaming, then we're going to get more money, especially in the year of COVID 19. They're saying, you know, it was harder to get some donations sometimes. We weren't so sure about grants or where it was going to go. People, Evidently, even throughout COVID-19, had no problem still gambling. Maybe they were using their stimulus checks. I don't know. (laughs) Um, That's a major argument in favor of this bill. It's basically New Hampshire can indirectly support charitable organizations, nonprofits, charities, that sort of thing. And let's be real. It's also going to bring in more for school funding. It's going to bring in more for those local operators, which are businesses in the area. So the fiscal note for HB 626, the Lottery Commission estimated that historic horse racing could generate over $5 million annually for charities and over $10 million annually for school funding. Pretty, pretty significant numbers. Yeah. I won't do my very long analysis of like how much things cost in the budget, but millions, okay? It's, it's, not, it's not peanuts. Mm-hmm. So let's be real though. These are not just all fun and games, right, uh, Mike? No, sadly, no. So opponents argue that these sorts of games are particularly addicting while uh, historic horse racing conjures up images of majestic animals racing in the Kentucky Derby. In reality, historic horse racing terminals are very similar to slot machines. And uh, the COVID pandemic has also led to many experiencing social isolation, job loss, stress, all of which are risk factors for compulsive gambling. Uh, And, you know, we were just sort of referring to this, but last year, the Mm -hmm. National Council on Problem Gaming received 443 calls to its 24-hour helpline from New Hampshire, an increase of 24% from the year before. Um, wow. So, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a problem for some people uh, in New Hampshire already without, without this. Uh, this year's bills also have uh, higher bet limits, so $25 versus $10, 
uh, than bills from previous years. And lastly, opponents argue that these bills are a cheap deal for charities. So the primary beneficiaries are the state and game operators. There are plenty of ways to support New Hampshire charitable organizations without expanding gambling in the state. Yeah. Like I said, I mean, like it is, it's, and as you said, full disclosure, we have received money from charitable gaming. And for us as a nonprofit, that is significant, but also these bus- these are businesses like mm-hmm. they're, they're charitable gaming, but it's not like all the proceeds go to charity. Most of the proceeds they, they get to keep because they're businesses. And that's also very much like a New Hampshire way. Right. You know, the sort of that private public like intersection. Uh, so, so, you know, and there, when you were when I was listening to some of the bill hearings on this, it's interesting because there's so much complexity around these issues. Some other states have a 21 and a minimum age of 21 for slot machines. And some people were saying maybe we should put that in. That's not in the bill. So we didn't really go into that here. And then there's also that question of should towns be able to sort of override what these businesses are doing and say no historic horse racing here. That's also not in the bill, but was another thing that got debated. So, yeah, regulating gambling. It's tricky. All right. So if listeners want to get involved and voice their opinion about historic horse racing, what should they do? Okay. Well, SB 112 passed the Senate on April 1st, uh, while HB 626 and HB 2 both passed the House on April 7th. All three bills will have more public hearings, but the House and Senate have yet to put them on the schedule. In the meantime, you can still voice your opinion on these bills by reaching out to your representative uh, and senators and telling them your thoughts about them. So to get started on that, you can find out who represents you on our website, citizenscount.org. Yep, just click on on that elected officials link in the navigation bar, and you can do your town by drop down, or you can look at a map even and just click where you are. Uh, So we try try to make it easy for you to, to phone, email, snail mail, whatever it might be. All right, now it's time for everyone's favorite segment, only in New Hampshire. Mike, tell me something weird about the Granite State. With pleasure. All right. I brought us a gambling-related factoid today for obvious reasons. The Granite State hosted the first legal modern state lottery, the New Hampshire Sweepstakes at Rockingham Park Racetrack in Salem in 1964. So the original game was based on the results of a horse race. So we have some history with this whole horse racing thing. Um, The funds were badly needed because the state had no income or sales tax to finance education programs, and it was based on the popular Irish sweepstakes. A ticket uh, cost $3, and the winners of the horse races at Rockingham Park Racecourse determined the biggest prizes. Uh, Despite the drawings not being held regularly, almost $5.7 million worth of tickets were sold in the first year. See, this is, it's like, it's hilarious to me because it's like, in some ways, nothing ever changes. Like, it right. was New Hampshire was using horse racing because they didn't want a sales or income tax. Yep. Here we are. What is this? Uh, 60 years later, and we're we're talking about horse racing in part because we don't like sales and income taxes. <laughs> there were a couple other, like, really entertaining factoids about this that I love. I read an article about this from New Hampshire Magazine. Shout out to them because they had some really funny details. For example, it, it actually violated federal law at the time to huh. have this lottery. So New Hampshire also was doing the thing that New Hampshire does sometimes where it basically flips off the federal government and is like, we do what we want. Um, I feel like you and I have talked about that sometimes. Yeah, it brings us back to the home distilling. Yeah, the home distilling was immediately the one I was thinking of. But so the federal government, what they ultimately decided was, all right, we, we can't regulate what New Hampshire does within its own borders, but we can, it's illegal to cross state lines with these tickets. So people were arrested in like New Jersey and Rhode Island and stuff for having New Hampshire lottery tickets. Huh. They were, it was because it was hugely popular. This was the first lottery in the nation. People were crazy to just try it. And so they were, you know, smuggling tickets over the border. <laughs> um, and another funny detail there is, I guess the way it worked was there was like a lottery to have your name picked to be associated with one of the, I think it was like six horses. So it's sort of like a a double, you know? So it's like, first you have to get picked up and it's just six. And then of those six, then there's the horse race. And so one of the six people that got a horse was Elizabeth Perkins. And she was the wife of a senator who was like, really anti sweeps action, like really anti lotteries. So I'm just imagining like the conversation at home when he's like, why did you buy a ticket? And she's like, because I want to win. Um, 
yeah, lots lots of fun little New Hampshire gems in that oh, one, yeah. for sure. Oh, yeah. That reminds me of uh, how during Prohibition, there would actually be legislators who voted in favor of Prohibition, but had, like, secret wine cellars in their houses and stuff. It's just like... What I, I mean, like, can we? It's probably the same thing going on with hobby distilling. Shout out there again to our earlier episode. I feel we just have to throw it back there. I'm sure that there are legislators. There's probably, I mean, there's 400 of them, so there's always at least one doing something. And I bet you there's one <laughs> legislator out there who is like, "This hobby distilling will destroy our state." And then at home, they have like five secret distills still. in their yeah. basement. <laughs> oh man. That wraps it up for our episode today. You can find more information and episodes at citizenscount.org. We'd also like to thank Franklin Pierce University for producing and the Granite State News Collaborative for hosting. Our theme music is composed by my friend Mike Dunbar. Lastly, we thank you for giving us a listen and thinking about how you can be a part of what makes New Hampshire by the people, for the people. 